Good morning, and thank you very much to the ICD for the invitation to such a very interesting conference with a real a bunch of very interesting personalities. I prepare a short paper on cultural diplomacy, uh, and following the discussion, I think it was too technical for the general approach we have had in this conference. For that reason, I will resume. I will not discuss definitions and other concepts, but I will try to, to tell you what happened in Latin America with cultural diplomacy during the Cold War and after, because that was very interesting. And many people, and I see in the audience, in Latin America was almost no mention here, so I am like an ET in, 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 in a conference showing uh, a continent. Uh, this continent, starting with a very general approach because people forget that, it is, um, if you think in only, we are around 700 million inhabitants. If you think in Brazil and Argentina only, they have the size, geographical size, as Europe and European Russia included. And if you think in Brazil alone, Brazil is more than Europe without Russia, without the European Russia. So they all, and, and we have um, 20 countries speaking Spanish or Portuguese, plus 14 more speaking in English or French, the Caribbean, and the, the, central, the other Central American countries. Well, what is the interesting talking on cultural diplomacy? The only mention that I like to do methodologically, it is that, in my opinion, it is interesting to speak cultural diplomacy when you have some kind of intervention of the public power. Cultural diplomacy, you can use it for everything. An artist can be a cultural diplomat or, or a scientific, but the, the noun is diplomacy. Cultural is an adjective. To combine cultural with diplomacy, you need the intervention of the state because the real diplomacy is played by the states. It's played by the public actors. The other are expressions that can be used. Uh, and we have in, in, in Latin America, of course, many cultural expressions that you can use it as cultural diplomacy, but diplomacy thinks that you like to achieve something or a negotiation to obtain a treaty or to get better knowledge of your country or image or identity, whatever. This is the, the only uh, short thing that I like to, to, to mention. And I go, I go directly to the fact that big powers, starting with the United States, but also the European nations, from Russia to Spain, from France to Italy or Great Britain and so on, they are practicing cultural diplomacy since many years. Since many years, and, and there are some examples that were given yesterday. This is rather different in, in Latin America. Because with the exception of Mexico, because of the big heritage, or Brazilian, because of the geographical and population they have, in general terms, cultural diplomacy in the sense that I have defined was not used in Latin America. On the contrary, we have a lot of possible expression of cultural diplomacy or expression of culture as such in persons when we think in Argentina and we think on tango or in soccer or Maradona, or Jorge Luis Borges, Ernesto Sabato, Mujica Laines, the film with Ricardo Darín. It is, it's a big potential. Big potential. Or in Chile, with Pablo Neruda, 
Violeta Parra, and so on, or Mexico, no? with mariachis, uh, Octavio Paz, and Brazil, hmm? starting Oscar Niemeyer, they, they built a, a, a complete city, the new, uh, the new capital, or Pelé, and soccer, and so on. The potential is very high. In Colombia, Cumbia, Garcia Marquez, Peru, Barrio Vargas Llosa, Nobel Prizes. We have a lot of Nobel Pri literature, Nobel Prize, and peace Nobel Prize. Perez Esquivel, Roberta Menchu. So the continent has a high potential, but not only playing the role of cultural diplomacy. On the contrary, I will show you that during the Cold War, after the end of the Second World War, Latin America, for a special condition, was a place where the two blocs play a very crucial and strong cultural diplomacy. Soviet Union and the United States mainly. In the 50s and the 60s, all Latin American countries become military dictatorships. Exceptions, Chile, Uruguay, and Costa Rica. Almost all other countries were under um, military control, strong support by the United States, with complete prohibition of any Soviet activities. The exception that later became Cuba, 58. So, in this case, in Uruguay and Chile, we're a specialized country to see the confrontation of cultural diplomacy. In the other countries, United States used simply the strategic power, not the soft power, because they supported the, 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 the military dictatorships. But in my country, in, in, in Uruguay, you have had, I have seen Bill Halley and the Comet, famous rock and roll orchestra. Uh, I, I knew Louis Armstrong, the famous jazz man, on the holiday on ice, whatever, different activities coming from the United States, not as commercial um, expression like you see today when we, tomorrow we can have here a concert that just with commercial cultural purpose. No, they were sent here. And against Ballet Valshoi, Moscow Circus, um, film, Soviet films, very famous Soviet films in the 50s and the 60s, Radio Moscow, and here, you, you know that because Sendes Freies Berlin and the Voice of America, there were a strong confrontation in our country. Using what? Cultural diplomacy. It was very, very interesting to see that because one week you got the, 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 the Soviet film festival, the next week is holiday on ice with, with the very famous skate players from, from the United States. So, and the other, the other condition the other interesting thing was that during the Cold War, the main concept or the main decision-making process was taken by politics. Politics was above everything. And I give some examples. If Latin American country wanted to sell shoes or bicycles or whatever, apples, to Czechoslovakia, not to Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia or to Poland, was crucial to sign a political agreement to cooperate and to produce a balance. If you sold to Czechoslovakia, I don't know how many shoes, you should buy from Czechoslovakia some Skoda or some other uh, machineries. That was the character between the blocks. Always political um, dominion on, on, on the trade and culture. And this is a paradigm that started in 1945 to the fall of the wall in Berlin, to 1990. It is true that the schema was lightening along the years. And then at the end of the 80s or at the beginning of the 90s, the situation had already 
change, but the radical change was produced in 1990 when they finished with the division of Germany. And now, in, in, I would say, and now paradigm changed radically. Today, and from 20 years ago till today, you used to have trade on investment and then to speak about other issues. For instance, our relation, Latin America in general, but mainly the, the, the so-called Pacific Alliance, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile, with Asia, we just start selling things, fruits, copper, whatever, uh, um, fisheries and so on. And Chinese, Japanese, Korean countries began to get a more strong interest and to develop cultural relations with our country. But after we have sell a lot of things, if we were in the, during the Cold War, it would be necessary to sign, first of all, political agreement and then to sell. Today, the paradigm is led by trade and investments and not by the political agreement. The political agreement or the cultural agreement and the cultural knowledge of the partners come after you have enough economics exchange. It's very interesting how that we have changed. For instance, in my country, China signed the first free trade agreement with Chile. It is incredible. The big country with the very small one, but the first, the first free trade agreement with Japan with Chile. The first free trade agreement with Korea with Chile. And what happened? That we are living Europe, we are the Latin American country, in favor of Asia. This is a new reality. And if you see yesterday, nobody mentioned Latin America. And it is not to criticize, it is just we are living new period. And today, my country, that was my country, not only my country, Argentina and Brazil, that we have always the European countries as the main export partners, today is for us China by far the, the number one, especially in some products that usually we sold only in Europe or in the United States, like wine. Chilean wine, the, the first client for Chilean wine is now China. And for Brazil, it's a very, very important uh, partner. And I suppose that for Brazil, is China today also more relevant than the United States. For us, it's China first and second United States. So this change of paradigm is um, a very, a very important for our new development. And there were some criticism in European Parliament because of the possible invasion of China in Latin America. And I remember in the House of Lords in London, when the Baroness Cooper delivered a very interesting speech saying, we cannot criticize China because we are living and we left Latin America alone. And then, why should not come China to Latin America? Now we are, we are getting once again some interesting initiative from Europe, but not in the way that was in the 50s, in the 60s, or previous to the first, to the, to the second, to the, to the first, to the, to the second um, world war, because at that time, Europe was the main partner and Latin America it's a continent where the Europeans are the main players. The, the European, because everybody comes from the Europe. In, 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 in the south of, of Latin America, in, Peru, in Uruguay, in Argentina, in Chile, we have native Chilean original, Mapuches, Rapa Nui, and Aymara, but few. All other coming from Europe. It's a, it's a joke when say, where come the Argentina from? From the ships. <laughs> the, 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 at that time, Italian mainly, but Spaniards in our country, 
Germans, uh, Croatians, Palestinian, and also Spanish, Italian, they, they, it's a big mixture, big mixture. Today, the countries are, as, as, as told you, looking much more to Asia. But, and currently, and yet I like to mention two small things, two important things that were mentioned yesterday, democracy and migration. Democracy, today, uh, when we have this main expression of xenophobia, nationalism, caudillismo, caudillo is, uh, is a Spanish word, uh, we risk democracy. As Pedro Sanchez mentioned yesterday, the Spanish, the Spanish uh, leader, democracy, it is a risk. It's a risk. It's at risk, to say exactly. Uh, why? And that was not mentioned. One very important factor is corruption in the public powers. In parliament, in government, this corruption along the years is making a big damage to democracy. First. Secondly, the permanently or the capacity of the elite to defend themselves, not to give up positions. This is another role. And if you see political parties are weakened, yet in Latin America, of course, but in Europe as well. If you look at here, Germany, no? Alternative Deutsch and fashion, different. Or do you look at, at uh, in Italy, you know, Beppe Grillo, another in Spain, in different places. We have in Chile a relative well organized democracy, but we have also these expressions. And Caudillos started a long time ago, and like every historical um, phenomena, they take time. But we started with Color de Melo in Brazil. We have had later Fujimori in Peru. We have had the family Kirchner in Argentina. This is typical caudillo. Chavez in Venezuela, and look at what happened in Venezuela today. Venezuela is in a very critical situation. And thanks to Vatican, Holy See, there are some, some dialogue, but if not, the, 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 the situation would be much worse. And here, if you see, we have Berlusconi in Italy, we have Beppe Grillo today, and we have in, 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 in Mr. Brexit in Great, in Great Britain. So, diplomacy is at risk, and we should take care, and the political parties and parliament should really clean up many things to defend democracy because I'm convinced that democracy is the best way to, to have public life or a social life in a country. But we are weakening democracy in a very risky way and it's very important to pay attention not only in third world countries like my continent but also in main countries like Europe because you have a very difficult tradition with populism and not five, 500 years ago, less than 100 years. This is, this is, this is something. We are very happy with the election in Austria. Huh? Very, but what was very... It was, you have a green president, but Austria had, till a few years ago, two main players FVP and, and, and SPD, or, and today they are disappearing. Okay. Last word, migration. Uh, we admire Frau Merkel, and I was, I was ambassador to Germany till six months ago, and we delivered a public speech admiring and paying tribute to, to her because she's one of the few politicians that make praxis from the values she say they are, she is defending. And when he decides 
to accept migrants, they didn't have, she didn't have, any political support in Europe. Even from people that used to say that it's in favor of migrants and so on and so on. But politically, she didn't get any support. We sent a strong support. I have a president that's very close friend of uh, from Merkel, from Bachelet, and we send the message saying we will accept thousand, thousand migrants in a small country like we are, but to, to, to give a sign on. But this will continue ahead. This come from the Romans. Maybe you have studied in this history, no? That during the Roman Empire, the Pacific invasion of barbarians. What was that? The same thing as today. Barbaria is a way to, to define. But where welfare exists, the people come to welfare. If you don't distribute welfare, you will have immigration that you cannot stop. And I can, it can once again about my country. We were spelled one million Chilean during Pinochet dictatorship all over the world. Well, all Chileans are back in Chile. Why we are back in Chile? Because we are development a, a, a welfare society, a society that allows you to work and so on. On the contrary, we have today, in the last five years, we are growing for zero, 0.5 immigrant to 3% immigrant. We have had in the last year, in the 2016, and along this year, new 50,000 people coming from Haiti. 300,000 from Peru, 100,000 from Bolivia, 100,000 from Argentina, 150,000 from Colombia. So we have had almost a million new people in my country in five years, and we are only 17 million. So immigration is not only a problem here, it's becoming a problem all over the world. And in Africa, there are migration from country to country to another, and there is a big responsibility to provide welfare, to provide opportunities in their own countries, not only in our country, because the people will migrate, will migrate. People have the right to live in, in, in favorable conditions. If you don't have work, if you are oppressed, if you are prosecuted and so on, and you don't have nothing to, to, to eat, so you, you, leave, you leave your country. Well, this is what I mean we should be aware and we should answer in a much more positive way what Merkel did, and especially that the, the, uh, the entrepreneurs, the companies, European, even Latin American countries, we should work in such a way that we can provide welfare locally to some countries in the world. If not, you will not stop migration. This would be a serious problem in the coming years because uh, people with hunger, you, won't, you, you, you don't stop it. They prefer to, to get a small boat and to finish in the Mediterranean in the, boat, in the, in the worst co condition uh, than to, to stay in, in, at home with hunger and, and no conditions to, to survive. So, thank you very much, and I'm ready to answer a question if you have. So. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for an excellent speech that I'm sure has inspired questions and comments. Let's begin in the second room. As always, if you could introduce yourself so that we know who you are. That's excellent. Uh, I'm Dr. Amir Laka, founder and chairman of Humanitarian and Charitable One Trust, based in London. Uh, I'm really impressed by your sincerity. It's coming from the heart. Thank you very much. Uh, we feel that corruption and uh, hunger for power weakens cultural democracy. We need to start thinking in terms of 
a system where we have the soft power as well as the hard power. And that is the way forward in this day and age. What do you think? No, well, I think I, I, I agree with you. I will add, I use the opportunity to ask following. Democracy is becoming much complicated because of our own decisions to introduce more transparency, to allow the freedom of the press, the scientific technological development of the media. 50 years ago, to discover that a member of the chamber in no matter what country was corrupt was very difficult to do that. It should be a very bold journalist that writes something in, in, in a famous paper. Today, you open Twitter, Facebook, or whatever, Instagram, and you discover immediately some things that are not regular that made political life, public life, a, a much more difficult. But transparency is a, is a virtue. But transparency should have a limit with pudor, we say in Spanish. How was the translation? Pudor? Pudor, pudor. With pudor, there is, a, there is a limit. This is the reason why we are not walking naked on the street when you have 35 degrees temperature. There is a, there is a limit for this thing. Because if not, you give free tribune and free place for very demagogic populist people, denouncing all the, the, the habit of the democracy, but not having any proper solution for the problem you are facing. It is, it is really, for that, for that reason I say, I, I say democracy, it is a risk. Because you are obliged to work with very open cards, you, you have to show everything, every day, and you have on the front of you, in a tribune, catch sometimes people fighting against democracy, saying things that are not, Pedro Sanchez say, say, uh, said yesterday, people giving wrong answers to real questions or something like that. More than wrong answers, they give you apparently good answers, not viable, without any facti uh, factibility, but shooting against democracy, against institution, against parliament, against political party. And we should really uh, reform strongly the way we are doing politics, democratic politics, to avoid that populism, because populism is caudillo, caudillo is authoritarian, yeah, and at the end, you have a bad finish. If you look at the situation in Venezuela, to, to speak about a very actual, a, a, a very current situation. The situation in Venezuela could finish in a very, very bad way in a few weeks or months. Today, the Venezuelans should go to Colombia to buy the, 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 the necessary, to buy hygienic paper or, or whatever, or, or pharmacy. No, they, they don't have anything. The richest country in Latin America. The richest country in Latin America has no, if you go to supermarket and empty, uh, and, and the government is saying that it's a conspiration for imperialism, and the people on the street, uh, it's in a, in a permanent revolution. Well, these are things that was produced because the previous democracy in Venezuela was very corrupt and the Venezuelan parties and parliament and government waste democracy. Today we have this situation. This should be improved and correct. The, Thank you very much for your talk. My name is Naomi, I'm a master's student here at the ICD, and I was very happy to hear a Latin American perspective in this conference. Um, I wanted to ask you, I was very interested to hear how much immigration has risen in Chile over the last few years. And I wanted to firstly ask, how has the civil society's response to this been? Has there been 
Has it been seen as a threat or has it been welcomed? I'm sorry, I don't hear properly what you're saying. Sorry. I was asking, uh, due to the, the recent rise in immigration to Chile, I wanted to ask how the response from civil society has been, if it's been welcoming or has it maybe felt threatened? And I also wanted to, to question the, the language you used at the end, you said to, to stop immigration. Is this uh, something that Chile is wanting to do or, or is it more a question of controlling immigration? I, I understand the first part, the, the, last, the last question I, I didn't follow. Uh, the last question, um, you, you mentioned at the end that, uh, that we have to work to stop immigration. Is it that you want to stop or is it more a question of controlling immigration? No, 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 no. I mean, f f first, the reaction had been very positive at the very beginning because with the many Peruvians, we have improved cooking in Chile. And uh, yes, Peruvians, yes, restaurants in Chile have improved a lot. So we have people with Argentina professionals also, very interesting. But right now, the situation is much more critical because in the north of the country, there are, for instance, between the 100,000 Colombian people, there are 95,000 very honest and, and probably serious Colombian, but there are an empire thousand that are devoted to prostitution and so on, and, and drug trafficking, and this is complicating the situation. And uh, as, as usual, populist people alarm against immigration, saying they will get your work, you will not have a job, and so on. So we have right now a discussion. The, the, the more rightist parties are proposing a law to, uh, to strain the condition to immigrate to Chile. The government is much more open for continue having immigration and to distribute along the country because we are a very, a very long country. But I think it will be critical if the amount of immigrants continue, that's it, no doubt. And secondly, when I say I'm, say, I'm not saying to stop immigrants, I say that people leave the country when they don't have conditions to live in the country. If you provide the conditions, if you invest in the country, if you uh, contribute to, to have education or uh, mainly to have jobs and not to have um, um, a bloody dictatorship and so on, people will stay, will stay in the country. As I show what happened with Chile, we were spelled almost a million, where everything is back. Of course, remain people outside because they create new families or they have jobs and so on, but in general, the big group came back to, to the country. Well, this can happen in other countries if the international community cooperate to allow a regular development of this country. For, for, for when, the, when, when we have the, the discussion here in Europe about Syrian, Afghan, and, and other immigrants, well, we should have eyes also how we cooperate in a better way to avoid these situations. I, I know Syria is almost impossible today, but there are immigrants coming from other countries that are not in such open conflict that um, can avoid if you give some help, some uh, um, development and some investments and some proposal to allow that the people live um, can live in his own country in, in, in better human conditions. Thank you. Here's another question. Here. Good morning, sir. Um, my question is, if I am allowed to ask this question, sir, it's very important to me. It's about my country. And I would like to ask, if in your country, are you practicing also the, um, the dragon war? What? War, uh, drug war. You are in war with drugs, so you like no, my no, no, president. No, no, no. Sorry? War. Drug wars, uh, uh, drug, 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 yeah. Um, because I am really very upset in my country because of what is happening now, and I could cry only if I heard about my country. 
So I would like to ask that if, if I'm allowed, is that, hap is that happening also in your country, no, sir? Well, 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 well uh, what happened in Chile, uh, first of all, what is happening in general terms in Latin America, you have more drug consumption in all countries because the welfare. The better, better economic condition produce also a, 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 a growing drug consumption. We are not an um, important drug market. We are a drug transit country because drugs, coca, is produced in Bolivia mainly, also in Peru and Colombia. And as Chilean has no visa necessary to fly to Europe or to the United States or Australia, drug traffickers use Chilean airports or Chilean ports to traffic the drug. But we have really, it is, I would say, I can say, ambassadors, solo people that make only propaganda for the country. But in this case, I'm very proud that we have a very efficient police to control drug trafficking, and with big success. Until now, we don't have um, corrupt people in the, in the chain for drug trafficking, no? When you have police corrupt, a member of the judiciary power, and, and so on. We don't have, in the case that we have surprised, or we have discovered, the people were punished, uh, not, it's not, a serious, serious problem like in, like in other countries, but it is growing the drug trafficking and it's growing, it growing the drug consumption because the welfare in the countries in Latin America. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. My name is Alice Contina. Originally, I'm from Russia, but I spent a lot of time in the Dominican Republic, and uh, we were facing a lot with the immigrants from Haiti. So you mentioned also that there is a big immigration to your country from Haiti. So my question is, do you have some special programs from the immigrants uh, of Haiti? Because first of all, they don't speak Spanish here, they speak uh, French. And uh, for sure they have more problems uh, if we compare them with the immigrations from other Spanish-speaking countries. Thank you. We, we, we don't know exactly why so many Asians in, in less than a year went to Chile. There are 50,000 in a year, it's a, it's a lot. Uh, I was in charge of the, if, uh, I was in charge of the peacekeeping, hello, I was in charge of the peacekeeping operation of the United Nations in Haiti two years. Um, and I can tell you that uh, Asian people is very special, had an artisan, artistic condition unique, what they provide and what you can buy on the street in Haiti will have, in, uh, well, as a matter of fact, it happened that in capitals like New York or, or Paris are, are sold as work of art in, a, in, a, in, a, in an incredible price. Well, these Haitians have a special condition, the elite it's very cultivated, very intelligent people. They speak four languages. They speak Creole, French, Spanish, and English, fluent. But they don't have any capacity to work in team. Teamwork doesn't exist in Haiti. This is the main problem. And I, I think that they are going to Chile because we have had, we have now, a, a Chilean named Jean Bossejour soccer player, national soccer player, and the team, one of the key persons in the soccer player, son of a Chilean lady and an Haitian person. And I have the impression that Bossejour, that is, you can, you can read it in the Latin American papers every day, or on radio, on TV, uh, playing football, make something that produce um, some attractive for Haitians to go to Chile because we don't have, we are very far away. We have, uh, from, from Chile to Haiti, then we have 10,000 kilometers uh, or 8,000, 8,000, 8,000 kilometers. And you have Dominican Republic to go, they have Brazil, they have uh, Colombia, Venezuela, other countries, but they, 
chose to go to Chile, also to Brazil, to Brazil, but in massive form now to my country. And I have the impression there are some um, small cases that pro provide some example. Ah, and the other people, the other Chilean, the Chilean troops and the Chilean police engaged in the UN operation in Haiti become very friendly to the, very good integrated with Asians. And I think that also the first group was almost invited by former police people or, or former member of the, of the army or, or for the public servant that were um, serving in Haiti. I think on that note, we need to conclude. Please express our sincere gratitude to the ambassador. We are grateful for the speech.